That's our first uh, first talk for 2023. Uh, we're excited to have Saki Bidio talking about uh, payment chains. Uh, and already we had a very nice conversation on monetary economics, a very topical, a very topical subject. Uh, many, many thanks to our amazing panelists for taking the time. Um, as a reminder, folks, if you're a panelist, just unmute yourself anytime and, and ask a question. Feel like, you know, it's like treated as, as a, a standard seminar. Uh, folks that are attendees, thanks so much for showing up. Uh, we're going to have a 15-minute Q&A after, uh, after, Psyche, after Psyche's uh, hourly presentation. And then, uh, we, you know, you can ask your questions using the raise uh, your hand button and I can I can promote you to the panelist and ask the question. Uh, very last thing of, of uh, housekeeping before we start, uh, I would like to tell you we're going to have three more presentations over uh, the semester. Uh, every second Monday of the month, we're going to be meeting online. And the first one is going to be by Andres Drenning of UT Austin on April 10th. Uh, take a look at our website uh, to find more information. So uh, now let me uh, stop sharing my screen. Saki, if you want to go ahead and share, and uh, after that, the floor is yours. All right. Can you see me? my, my slides? Looks great. All right. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present at the Search and Matching Microfinance uh, online seminar, especially in a day like this, that it's very exciting for, for microfinance to um to 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 sit and look at my slides anyway so this paper the idea of this paper is to provide a theoretical foundation for a very common narrative that we um that we listen when we read a lot of uh, read about financial crisis and it's the idea that during crisis there are delays in payments so it's the notion that firms or individuals are waiting to pay in order to be paid, um, are waiting to be paid in order to make payments, and that slows down uh, economic production. This was a narrative that was very prevalent in the first uh, financial crisis I was aware of, which was the 98 crisis uh, in, in Peru. But if you think about it, it's something that is not present in standard uh, macro models, because in macro models, if agents are constrained, they cannot buy uh, goods or buy capital and they the capital is, is moved to another company and there can be misallocation. But there's no notion that agents are waiting for something to happen. And as they are waiting, uh, resources are, are lost. In, in standard financial um, uh, macro models, agents are either constrained or unconstrained. The only precedent that I'm aware of is uh, a very beautiful paper by, by Nobu, who is, who is a panelist here, which is called Credit Chains. And um, the contribution relative to that paper is th um, the idea that here, decisions that happen between periods and how agents want to perform payments endogenously determine a network of, of payments. And that enters in a business cycle model that has novel implications. Um, as a byproduct of the model, the model is going to offer a formalization of the TFP puzzle. The TFP puzzle is the idea that many financial crises, not necessarily the Great Recession, for example, but many financial crises predominantly show through um, declines in total factor productivity. If you think of the New Keynesian model, the dimension where you should see declines in, 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 in production should be through labor wedges. Uh, but it's it's been a challenge for the literature to generate large movements in TFP. There's Ezra, for, for example, who's, who's also here, has worked on capital misallocation. But the common, the common idea or the common outcome in, in this type class of models is that misallocation is only partially successful in explaining declines in TFP. And they need something that explains uh, the, the, the idle use of uh, or, or, or resources. And so in this model, when there's delays in payments, resources are going to remain idle, and that's going to show up as declines in, in total factor productivity, uh, in measured total factor productivity. So the paper is going to have two blocks, one block that is autonomous, that is uh, going to present this idea of Payment chain, payment chains, and payment chain networks. 
And then that autonomous block will be embedded in a business cycle model to derive new conclusions. So the payment chain block works as follows. So in the model, agents can order, will order production. So production is not bought in a valuation market, but rather in bilateral meetings, agent play, agents place uh, production orders. Some orders have the property of being paid immediately. And these are, I call spot orders. And the other orders are contracted, but agents commit to make the payment for that order after they are paid for selling something in previous orders. So this structure of putting orders in place will create endogenous payment chains that depend on the fraction of orders that are paid spot and paid chain. A payment chain in this environment will be a sequence of, of orders that are indexed by, by some payment. And there's going to be a collection of such payment chains within a payment chain network. And the idea is that the larger the average payment chain in the network, the average, the longer the average production delay in the network, and that's going to show up in TFP. So this is going to be an autonomous block that you know we, you could enrich in different ways, or you can embed in different environments. And then the second part of the paper, I'm going to introduce that payment chain network into a business cycle model, an extremely simplified business cycle model, where there's a payment chain network formed every period. There's going to be two agents, and there's going to be debt dynamics. And the structure of the debt dynamics will lead agents to make endogenous choices on whether to make spot payments or chain payments. And that's going to endogenously create a payment chain network. And a key feature of the environment that leads to some interesting business cycle properties is that agents don't internalize the effect of their payment choice on aggregate TFP. So there's going to be an externality in the environment. So one way to think about the externality is through an analogy with traffic. So one way to think of externalities in traffic has to do with how agents drive, you know, the stop and go motion of different drivers that creates delays uh, in traffic. But one macro way of thinking of traffic uh, and externalities is the number of cars out there. In the model that I'm going to present, the fundamental friction has to do with payment delays, but that's something the government can't control. It's going to show up or as a result of debt choices by agents, which is something that the government can affect. So the implications should be seen from the evolution of debt. The government cannot mess up with how agents drive in the traffic analogy. They cannot mess up with individual choices. Uh, on how they make payments, but they can influence debt. And when you think about that form of Saki, can I ask you a quick question? Sorry. To... Yeah. So, like, there, there used to be this like literature on, uh, sorry, on uh, like optimal settlement systems. I don't know if you saw this stuff, and it was about like whether things should be cleared in real time or netted at the end of the day and stuff like that. So, mm. is this paper kind of taking a stand on? how the settlement system works? And not then... at all. Okay. Not at all. So that's what I mean by, by micro frictions. Yeah. So I have nothing to say about the trading environment and the protocols of transactions. Okay. The clearing, you know, th there are ways in which you can improve outcomes in this model by changing the way the transactions operate. Say if you had a centralized clearing house, for example. Things yeah, something like that. But things would be different. So I don't want to touch that in this paper. Gotcha. I want to touch the idea that when agents take too much debt, for example, the next period, they're going to make chain payments. They're going to be forced to make chain payments. And they don't internalize that by making chain payment. They delay the payments on others. And that has an externality. That's going to be the notion of inefficiency. Okay. So we, when we start from that notion of inefficiency, we will arrive at the several the, the following set of results. So first of all, when you start from low debt levels, we end, we end up in a situation where steady we live in steady state and the economies run 
efficiently and there are no production delays, TFP is maximized. For moderate debt levels, you have inefficient transitions towards steady state. They're inefficient in the sense that a planner would choose a different path of debt. But in the end, they converge to an efficient steady state. And there's a notion of inefficiency related to whether there's a complementarity or substitution that I'll make clear toward the end of the talk between redistributing wealth and improving economic efficiency. And there are areas of the state space where redistributing complements productive efficiency or it substitutes productive efficiency. I'll be clear about that. I think that's a novel aspect of the theory. And then, so that's what I call inefficient crisis. And then there's the possibility also of hysteresis. So it's the idea that if debt is sufficiently large, we may remain in a steady state where the economy is permanently operating with low TFP, where a lot of transactions are delayed and no agent has, in, has incentives to delever, unlike what happens in, in um, macro finance models. The final uh, result that I want to show you that comes out from this environment is a novel result on government multipliers. I call these the Bocola effect because it was something that Luigi Bocola hinted to me that could happen in this environment. And so in this model, it matters how the government spends. So when you are in a sufficiently deep crisis in the model, if the government, if governments make payments on the spot, just like agents can make payments on spot, there are positive mo government multipliers that can lead to positive welfare gains. However, if the government makes chain payments, if it says, I'm going to spend just to, uh, you know, just to stimulate demand, say, if it had that notion in mind, but it doesn't pay for things immediately, it actually lowers TFP and it, it has a negative effect on, on outcomes. So it matters how the government spends for government multipliers. So that's the introduction. I make connections with the theory of financial crisis and you know, um, models of payments and trade credit, tangentially with models of endogenous networks. I have nothing to say about the endogenous creation of links, but rather how debt affects um, the number of chain payments or spot payments. And that has a uh, creates a network of its own. And then there's, there's a connection with aggregate demand externality models, which are all linked to a number of papers that are cited in, the, in, the, in, in my work. So I'm going to start the, the talk like this. So I'm going to go first over the, gen, over the general environment. Then I'm going to focus exclusively on the bilateral relations. And I'm going to focus on bilateral relations just presenting you the geometry of payments. So you should think of this as just, as you would think in physics, just, just who's linked to who as a function of parameters. There's no endogenous choice at that moment. Then I'm gonna focus on how the bilateral relations coupled with frictions in the, in, in the transactions lead to production delays. And all this block, all these bilateral relation block will operate mechanically. If you tell me what is the fraction of chain per payments and spot payments, I can tell you what TFP is. So I'm going to go after develop, finding a function that maps the way in which people want to spend to TFP. And then I'm going to embed that in a business cycle model, characterize the, the business cycle model, and then talk about debt overhang, hysteresis, and government multipliers. So. Let me go into the model. So the, mo the way the general model works is as follows. So there's a discrete time of periods where expenditure decisions are made at the beginning of each period. And that's like integer dates. So you should think of that as the analogy of uh, decentralized market in, in the terminology of Lagos and Wright, if you want. And then within each period, there's a continuum of periods where there's a large number of transactions go that are going to take place. And within that large number of transactions, production is carried out. And when transactions are delayed, production is delayed and there's a loss within the period. 
everything is going to be deterministic. And to make the model interesting, you need some agents to be constrained. And for that, I'm going to introduce heterogeneity of some, of some form and financial constraints. When I work on the business cycle model, I'll specialize in a specific environment, but we can always generalize things. So production is carried out in specialized goods that are formed or that are produced after agents meet bilaterally and they assign orders of production that are specific to the customer in the bilateral relation. And there's a random bilateral assignment in the model. Within the period, agents are making decisions on how much to spend spot with current funds or funds that they could obtain by getting a credit line. Or they can also decide to make payments by committing to pay after they sell something in another bilateral relation. So you should think of this as saying, I'm going to put um, a number of payable orders that I that I honor with receivables that I have. And this is going to create a, a network of payments. Yes, Saki, Saki, yes. sorry. Hey, uh, super quick. So here, the, cho the choice is a choice of the buyer or the payer or... Uh, suppose the, I want to sell the it. buyer, yeah, but the buyer. Uh, suppose I do it in the other way, okay? Like, kind of the seller is choosing, I only sell you spot or whatever. Would this would the seller choose or allow for these chain orders or perfect? So, the model is set up in such a way that the seller is in perfectly indifferent between one way or the other. So, the seller is willing to accept identically spot orders or chained orders because he's paid the same. That's the assumption. Right, but that's not the same. Is that the same to say that if the seller was allowed to, to choose, in the, if I'm saying correctly, you're saying it's going to be different, but the buyer is setting this, the terms of trade, if I'm saying this. The buyer, so the terms of trade, you'll see, this is a key assumption. The, the buyer is in, the terms of trade are fixed. Every transaction is, is going to be for the same amount, regardless of the amount of product that, that you're selling. And that's because the seller has one unit of time. And he has to, the only commitment is to say, I don't produce until you bring the money and output is lost in between. But his opportunity cost would be to go to another uh, customer and he has to be indifferent. But imagine the opposite. Like, just, I mean, I'm okay, okay. Like, I kind know of that actually the seller says, okay, uh, I'm selling you. I, I meet you and said, okay, I will give you the goods, but later the opposite. I will say, like, I, I want to wait until you find the money. You yes. show me the money. I give it to you. We already are in a relationship, but I will wait for it. I mean, like, yes, I and 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 he will do that. Okay. But before agreeing to to do that, he has to say, look. I could have formed a relationship with somebody that has the money. Got it, got it. So I have to be guaranteed that you're going to pay me the same amount, regardless of whether I have to wait or not. The reason why I have to wait is because if I don't wait, you're going to screw me. I'm going to start producing something. And then tomorrow you come and say, you don't have the money. And I end up producing something. So, so in that sense, you know, he, he's indifferent. And that's part of the uh you know bilateral stability okay um but yeah it's a, it's a it's a key assumption okay so let me first start by showing you how payments are are carried out and then we take this to to study tfp so let's take as a primitive that agents have already pre-programmed expenditures some sp expenditures are spot and some expenditures are chained and the total expenditures are up add up to one. That's a, that's a key assumption that later in the business cycle model, prices guarantee that that happens. So total expenditures has to equal total income and that's equal, total income is gonna be equal to one. So expenditures, the type of expenditures will map to specific amount of, of production and that's what I'm after. So. After these expenditures are decided, we need to specify how production is carried out. And because the 
setup has bilateral trading, I need to think of in and indivisible labor units so that I work with integers. So here labor is the numeraire and one unit of labor pays, you know, is worth one, one, um, one dollar it's or one unit of um or work so i'm going to work first with n units of labor when i move to the business cycle model i'm going to take n to infinity so i have to so i have to i don't have to be bothered by whether integers are div divisible into decimal quantities of expenditures so that's the idea so remember that total expenditures add up to one so we can count the number of transactions that are spot, that will be NS, and the number of transactions that are chain. So the fraction S or ES is just a fraction of expenditures that are spot. If we multiply those transactions by the number of labor units, that tells us which number of transactions are spot and which are chained. And I use this floor, this floor number to guarantee that these uh, fractions are integers. And the notion of market clearing is that the number of labor units are associated with one chain payment and one spot uh, payment each. Now, because there's equal amount of labor units, chain payments, and spot payments, we can enumerate things. So I'm going to use this enumeration to set up a network. So the first thing to note is that because there are n labor units, the n labor units can create an index for the labor units. So unit two or unit three refer to a specific labor unit. And if we add the collection of chained expenditures and spot expenditures, and we enumerate the same way we enumerate labor units, we enumerate payments, we find that there's an equal amount of payments per labor unit. This is important because it tells us how the labor, or sorry, the labor relation or the bilateral relation is formed. So there are two important relations in this environment. So the first is an income expenditure relation. This is given by this identity function, IOTA, which tells us that among the set of orders that are chained, so this is essentially an enumeration set for the chain orders, it tells us which is the labor unit that will be the source of income that will be used to make payments in that chained order. It's just the identity function. So if I make chain order 15, labor unit 15, the income of labor unit 15 will be the source of payment of order 15 if it's chained. If it's spot, you don't need a labor income unit because you have another source of payments. The second identity or the second relationship is this random production assignment. This is telling us basically which order is ordering from what labor unit. So H, for example, tells us that order 15, whether it's spot or chain, will order from production unit 25. It's perfectly random. And the only assumption is that there are no cycles in the, in the same node. So the idea that you cannot order from yourself. This is just a formalization of something that is very simple to explain with a picture. So here's the idea. You're seeing several nodes in this uh, network. And the blue nodes represent orders that have been indexed, you say order one, two, three, et cetera, if you go clockwise. And when you see a blue dot, a blue note, that represents an order that can be financed, can be paid without the need to get income from the corresponding income source that would be associated with the same index. But if you see a green dot, that means that spot or that order two is the source of that um, order, the source of payments of that order is the income associated with income unit two. So the first thing that you're seeing in this picture is for chained orders, which is the source of income. The second relation 
tells us which order. So say in this example, order two is buying from order three. Order three is a spot order that happens to buy from income, income unit eight or production unit eight. And so already what you see from this second picture is that when you see a order starting from a spot order, which is in blue, the payment will flow to the production unit associated with the bilateral relation of production. And then order unit eight will transfer those funds to the corresponding chain payment order that needs the funds from eight to buy from one. And if you track payments across the chain, you'll find that there's a, a, pay, a, a collection of payment chain networks. So a payment chain network starts from a spot expenditure, and then it goes to the order associated with the production order that comes after. And if it's chained, the transaction, the same funds that start at seven will go to four and from four to six and six to two. And then two will end up in three. And that's the end of a payment chain because three, by virtue of being a spot order, it has its own funds. So it does not need external or internal use or internal funds from the network to make payments. It has its external um, source. So in this picture, you see three networks, the green one, three chains, the green one, the blue one, and the purple one, corresponding to a collection of payment chains. There are three payment chains of different length in this in this example. Okay. First of formalization. Yeah. Really, really quickly. So yeah. um, for, uh, in terms of the physical environment, should I yes. think of these circles as workers? Is that a reasonable yes. way of yes. thinking of it? Like yes. a worker in a, yes. in a literally yeah. a worker associated with uh, another shopper. Yeah. And that's why and I actually chose, they, chose they, a notation. They, and there's a random assignment, like there's a random matching of these workers to possible buyers of yeah. what they produce. Exactly. And exactly. then all of them get matched to a possible buyer. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Correct. And if you are a worker that are associated with a shopper that has funds, your income is not relevant for the shopper. But if you are associated with a shopper that needs funds, then the shopper will have to wait until you get income. But well, that's coming next. This is just the physical environment to track transactions. Um, I think the so I can avoid the, 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 the randomness is just for for theoretical, like it's convenient for developing the theory, right? Yes. But in, in principle, it's not super important. Or no, no, yeah. no. But I haven't thought on environments where there's sorting or things like that. I have not thought about that. Uh, I, I, I just work with this one. Now, this is a property of the environment. So take the ratio of chain payments to total payments and call that mu. I call that the chain ratio, the chain payment ratio. This is a property of the network. The, as you take n to infinity, this is key. If you take n to infinity, the ch the average chain length is going to be distributed geometric with parameter mu. Okay. So what that says is, if you go to this picture and you take the ratio of green dots to total dots, and you work with this random assignment, and you take n to infinity, the distribution of chain length, meaning what fraction is has four links? What fraction has two links? What fraction has one link, et cetera, et cetera? That is distributed geometric. Okay? And that property, Huberto, is really important because then I can use a law of large numbers to compute TFP after I talk about delays. So having said that, let me move to, to, to speak about the delays. But Saki, you mentioned physics, and then I was just thinking here, like, um, you know, like a big plant, and what are these operation research guys doing? I mean, it feels to me like uh, 
that's sort of a big part the you know like a big part of their problem and I'm trying to think about um you know whether um uh, they you know you you have this random ordering and and like these guys maybe are thinking about how you place the um because you know you have the payments but in some sense it's like if I have to wait for this piece to go on with my piece of you know, like it's similar, right? It's a little bit like similar. So I'm confused about why isn't that as opposed to physics the very, the more obvious, like uh, close field? Yeah. Well, um, okay, it's a great question, and I I would love to be able to think about whether you could merge two of these production units to to create greater efficiency or avoid. avoid um, payment delays and maybe even thinking about the theory of the firm in this environment. But that's that's way too difficult for me at this stage. Um, and I, I was just thinking about if you impose this production structure, what would you get? And I think the conclusions in the back are, 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 are interesting, but there's many more interesting things going on with the micro st structure of transactions that it's related to Nico's uh, question uh, that I won't, or to Ben actually, Ben's question that I won't touch in the talk. Let me move and talk about transactions and production delays. So here, production is going to start depending on when agents come and say, here I have some funds. So each order starts production at some time tau that depends on the, on the network structure. And the idea here is that you have one unit of time to start production, but if you are a producer in a bilateral relationship and the customer comes at time tau between zero and one and says, hey, I have the funds, you cannot start production until he comes and says, I have the funds and shows you a proof of funds. And the idea is that if agents weren't do that, weren't doing that, then other agents would come and say, I want to start production orders and I will pay you later and they never have the funds. So you wait until the agent has proof of funds to divert agents who could scam from coming into the network. The second part is that once the the customer shows proof of funds, production starts, but the customer cannot release the funds until he inspects a little part of the production. The fraction of the production that he has to ins inspect is the fraction one minus delta of the production that will be carried out in the remainder of the period. And the idea of that friction, the idea behind that, that friction is that you could have a form of limited commitment in, in the sense that the producer says, oh, I have the funds. Uh, I received the funds and now I produce something for myself and I screw you over. So the client has to inspect a little bit of the product before he releases the funds. So he has to show the product to start the, the payment uh, availability to start production. And then he has to wait a little bit until he can release the, 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 the funds. So that's going to provoke delays. Every time I pay late, you know, because the agent received or can, could be paid, but there has to be an inspection, there's a little bit of delay in the following transaction. And that's key because otherwise you, all you would need is just one spot payment and to travel all over the network and everything would unravel immediately. And the so final assumption is that this is, goes back to Nico, Nico's question, and this has to do with clients, uh, sorry, uh, producers are perfectly indifferent between all sorts of transactions because there's unit price. The, they're paid for their full uh, time, regardless of when they start production, and that's to guarantee uh, pairwise stability. Uh, and there's no default by the, by the buyer. Okay. Now, in, in full honesty, this is the, the weaker part of the paper 
because I can think of all these frictions individually. I haven't thought of in a way to have like a full contract or for a whole society where everything is happening at the same time. That's that's full disclosure. So, Saki, can you explain a little bit more the timing and so that I can fully understand yes. this part? So I, yes. I'm with you. We you say that okay, I'm going to send you in the future, something like that. At some point, you come in the middle and say, "Okay, Nico, here I have kind of the fans. Start, start producing for me. Uh, the times to produce this kind of cow kind of thing. Yes. Uh, that's a cost, I guess. Uh, on the other side, uh, you want to expect I'm doing this thing. This this other uh, delta that is also a cost. Yes. Uh, but why not doing kind of more different, like kind of like kind of futures, you know, like kind of, you come to me and say, look, I don't have any money now. Uh, because you're still committed to me, right? You cannot renege yes. and I cannot renege either. No, you can, no. So you can, if you, can. yeah. So the idea is okay. if I, you know, if I don't have the funds, I could come and say, Nico, hey, you know, I have these receivables that, that, uh, you know, I'm making up and you start producing for me the product is exclusive. And then at the end of the period, I come to you and say, Nico, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, I didn't get the funds. But, but you but, already produced something for me. And so but, we but, would negotiate yeah. and I would screw you. But when I buy in the spot, there's no towel, right? When you buy spot, there's yeah. no towel delay. Right? So um, this guy is spot. Let's travel through this network. Yeah, yeah. So if seven is spot, he shows the money that he has funds immediately at the start of the period. So tau is zero for him. There's no delay. But for four, four starts producing at time zero. So there's no delay in this production order. But four needs the funds from seven. And But seven has to inspect four production. And so... Before, so four will have the funds only by the time that seven inspected four, and that's their, their leads, their lead, that leads to a little bit of a loss in, in the one minus delta inspection time. Then four makes the payment to six, and six has to uh, start production at you know whatever time the, the, the four shows the funds, but then four has to inspect six, and there's a second delay going all the way to two. I guess what I don't understand, but whatever, eh? for later is, is this type of thing like a feature of when we contract that you pay me in the future, this, this other things are how produce production is kind of costly or is it's just time? I, I didn't follow. It's just time. It's just time. Time okay. is lost because you cannot start production until you show me the funds. And my motivation behind it is if That's I start fine. production be before you have the funds, Somebody could come, some external guy could come in and order production that is exclusive for him. Nobody else can eat that production. And then he screws the, the seller that could have sell, sell, sell to somebody else. But as a result of that, you get the same, the, the, the following sequence of output within a production chain. So suppose you have a production chain that starts with S and then it's, chain, 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 and then the length is N. So for the first guy, the spot guy, output, as we said, is gonna be one. There's no loss for the guy that makes spot payments. He inspects the, the good in the amount of time one minus delta. He transfers the fund by time one minus delta, but then the second guy has only the remainder time, which is just delta to produce. So when he makes the payment, there's only delta time remaining, there's an inspection and then the second guy can only have a, a, a good that is well delta squared, delta cube and delta n all the way to, to, to the last guy. So if you're the last guy in the chain, you're going to receive the goods very, very late. And by the time you can make the payment, the amount of output that you can get is very low. But there's nothing you can do at the moment. So second, uh, can, 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 I, can I ask one thing? So uh, here, um, there is some externality agent, they don't internalize from payment and yes. credit. So there might be some gain for bank to enter to the economy. So we can think about bank as a collision of the loop, and then everyone will be coordinated by the bank to make the payment choice. 
then yes. it could avoid all this inefficiency and uh, external. Yes. Am, am I yes. right to say that? So the yes. result there's might a, be a, not in the favorable. dynamic setting. In the dynamic setting, um, credit lines play that role. So if credit lines are sufficiently large, then everyone can make spot payments. But I let me let me postpone that discussion to 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 when I show that. Because credit is a way to avoid all of this. If everyone can make spot payments and they could contract with banks, then all this would go away. And the, the key assumption is that there's not sufficient credit in the economy if debt is sufficiently large. But um, right, right. The, the model is beautiful. I'm just thinking, ah, maybe there's one natural way to think about bank would be like a collision. Yes, of, yes. Of but let world. me let me right. let me postpone that to the business cycle yeah. model. So all can, I want to I, sorry I, I, yeah. I might interrupt a lot, but like so there is a something about the economy is maybe maybe we should wait for the but like it's like the economy is kind of instantaneous in the folly sense we all know our consumption and our bilateral needs right like yes. if the if the model was had some flavor of because for most situations, right? Like you're sitting here, you you might be waiting some payments here or there, but you're still searching for what's gonna be your stranger to opportunity. So you think about in the limits of your model, if the discrete case might be easier to, to think about. It's like the guy one just consumes in period one, the guy two just consumes it. So there is a time length where the payments can go through before you actually have the, the consumption opportunity or the production opportunity, right? Yes. So it's kind of like the fact that everyone, if they could, so as you said, if the delta and the, the tau and the, the delta were zero, yes. everyone would consume instantaneously and there is no dynamic in the economy, right? Correct. Correct. So like that's gonna yeah. that's gonna show up. Let's wait for the business cycle model because all that should be clearer there. All right. I'm gonna make some assumptions that eliminate all randomness from idiosyncratic risk of where you are in the chain and 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 um like in a big family assumption. And that's going to allow me to produce some sharp conclusions. But Taki, okay. just so I understand, there's like a there's just a cost of contracting in the future, but there's no there's no gain from contracting in the future. There's no there's no sense in which it, I'm constrained right now, but uh no I, there there are gains, but I'm just we're we're we just have some features in the environment that motivate um this this interruption of of making future contracts. Okay, I didn't. I didn't. So is the the frac the ideally, fraction? Ideally, of... if everyone could say, "Hey, you know what? <clears throat> I'm gonna eventually in the chain. I am. I'm gonna get. Um, I'm gonna eventually get money. Say, I'm I'm guy two here, which is the yeah. third guy in a chain. And and he says to three, "Hey, I'm gonna get money uh, e e eventually because I'm gonna sell to six. So six no, no, I understand that. I guess the part I'm so, missing is where's the dis like is it endogenous decision of whether you do the spot or the yes, the yes, but I need to show you the 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 macro environment before okay. before that comes. That's okay. in the business cycle model because it oh, okay okay it, I'll it shut depends up. on on debt and uh, dynamic choice. So it's it, it goes to Bruno's uh, point. For now, I want to just present present things as if we were in a in a you know in a, in a physics environment. And so the takeaway at this point is that. If you um, track these frictions, and if you know that there's a chain of length n, these are the individual productions in that chain. Now we know the distribution of chain lengths in the environment as n goes to infinity. Wait, uh, sorry, that's my timer. And then as n goes to infinity, and um, and we know the production per, per chain, then uh, we can compute aggregate TFP. So total product production. Um, and total production is captured by this function, which is the average TFP among chain orders. For spot orders, production is one. But for chain orders, depending on the distribution of other ch uh, chain payments, you have an average production among chain orders. And that average production is less than one. And it's given by this, this function that looks almost like an entropy function. So this is the idea. The longer mu, 
or the higher mu, the average delay on payment chains is longer. So TFP is longer. So this is the higher the fraction of orders that are chained, the longer the average payment and the longer or the lower the production uh, delay. So in particular, if mu goes to one, then production actually goes to, to zero. And here on the left panel, you see the average payment chain distribution. For high mu, the distribution shifts to the right. So greater delays. Why if mu, if mu is zero, why you don't get one? Sorry, maybe Oh, because it. if mu is zero, um, this is the average production among chained orders. So you should go to delta, Got it. not to one, because Got you're it. the only guy with one delay. Got it. Now, TFP is, of course, the average of the delay among the chain orders, which fraction mu, and the uh, and uh, the other fraction gets one. Okay. So now, think of this is going to be important to map it into the business cycle model. Think of a guy that makes chain uh, and spot expenditures. The guy that makes spot expenditures, the unit cost, say, or the unit price is one, that guy gets exactly one for one spot goods, which I call S, for the amount of expenditures that are spot. Think of a guy that makes chain payments. On average, he's gonna be randomly allocated in the chain. His average output or the number of goods that he can get is A. If you invert this, if you move it to the left, you can think of the inverse of TFP as a price. When I make chain payments, the number of goods X that I can buy have, quote unquote, an endogenous, like we would behave like an endogenous price, which is the inverse of TFP. So the lower TFP is as if the price of chain goods is higher. So the next question we should ask is why would anyone make chain orders? So that's where the business cycle model comes in. Okay, so in the business cycle model, I think we can, there are many ways in which we could have written this business cycle model, but here I'm gonna focus on the simplest case, case possible, which I can solve almost analytically, in which I have a one guy that is a saver and borrower at the same time, sorry, a saver, uh, and then a guy that is a worker and borrower at the same time. Okay, so there's two guys, a saver and a worker that is the borrower in society. So this will be clear in a second. And the purpose of this simple environment is just to highlight the key externalities. So I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna try to show the business cycle model really quickly. Some parts should be very familiar. So the saver problem is the following. He has savings D, you can think of these as deposits. He's gonna save some deposits tomorrow at rate RT plus one. And then he has to make a choice of goods S and X. Q is the inverse of TFP, which is endogenous depending on whether other agents buy S or buy X, okay? So he's perfectly indifferent between spot goods and chain goods. TFP is always less than one, so the price is always greater than one. So for the saver in society, he never, um, he never buys chains good, chain goods. It's always cheaper to make spot payments. And this guy can always make spot payments because he's a saver. He doesn't have a source of income. So he will always leave a little bit of room. And he, since he's log, log utility, um, then he consumes the fraction one minus delta of his savings. So, so nothing is interesting from, from the saver's perspective. It's just a mechanical rule for, for savings for him. Now, the worker, the workers where the interesting things happen, the worker is like a big family assumption where there's N labor units and, and N shopping units. And the worker's family assigns one shopper to one worker, as in the um, income expenditure relation in the network. And I'm gonna work with N infinity as the worker family grows to, to, to infinity, but total labor income is set to one because there's total overall, uh, you know, the overall sum is norm of, of worker units are normalized to one. So the worker problem, the objective is, a, is the same as the saver. 
And the budget constraint has only one difference. I'm or reordering things so that debt now is on the right hand side. He's always, because the other has, guy has no source of, of income, he always will have to save. And the worker has a source of income, so he will always be the borrower. And so in this budget constraint, I include one, which is a total income of all the worker units, but then he makes the choice of spot payments and chain payments. He's also indifferent between goods bought spot and goods bought chain. And this goes to Russell's question. So in order to make spot payments, this guy has to have enough credit lines. So if the banking system could agree and say, let's give them enough credit lines so that he can all make, he can make as many spot payments as possible, then everything would be spot, everything would work beautifully and no delays. But he has a limit on how much he can borrow spot. So he's taking debt, B, and if ever his current debt exceeds this credit line limit within the period, this is like your credit line in credit card and this is your overall debt, this is the maximum S that you can spend. And unlike a financial friction model, traditional financial friction model is not like if you don't have funds, like in Ayagari, you can't consume. That doesn't happen here. You can always make chain payments, right? So this is just a constraint that operates on the spot payments. But if the banking system is not financing you, you can still buy goods by making you know, this promise to buy goods when you are paid. And there are many of these uh, little payments that will be carried out within the family. So obviously this guy will make chain payments only when he's constrained, when the credit lines are not enough, okay? So let me go to the characterization and here's the, a key feature. So if your debt is above your credit limit, you cannot make any spot payments. And you don't make any chain payments if the debt that you hold tomorrow is um, below this amount, okay? Because if you are not taking too much debt, that means that you're not um, consuming that much. And if you're consuming very little, you will first consume with your credit line because making chain payments is expensive. So there are two kinks um, that govern which is the type of expenditure that you make. These kinks are important for the dynamics. And since I'm skimming over, I'm gonna go fast on the business cycle model, I'm just gonna highlight some properties graphically. So on the top left panel, what I'm showing you is in partial equilibrium, assuming that the interest rate is one over beta, how the value function of the agent that is a worker is behaving. So the actual value function is this black solid line. And the black solid line falls between two value functions. The blue value function is as if the guy was never constrained. It's Tilde B, tilde B, infinity. And the gray is actually, he cannot make any spot payments. So it's like, you always make chain payments. So notice that the value function for sufficiently low debt levels, holding tilde B fixed, the steady state value function coincides with a value function as if there was no constraints. So that means that if the high guy has very little debt, the constraints are irrelevant. He can, he has enough wealth to make spot payments and make everything spot. And he's very happy to do so. But if his debt is excessively high, he cannot make any spot payments at all. And he, if he cannot make spot payments at all, everything has to be chained. And there are consequences for society, but I'll describe that in a second. But the value function is as if 
he was chained forever. So the reason why that's interesting is because if you think of the debt policy associated with this value function, it means that if your debt is very low, you behave as if you're in steady state and you're an average agent that whose price is one and you stay there forever and you consume your permanent income. If your debt is excessively high, you also do the same thing. But the interesting thing is that your debt is excessively high and you're also making only chain payments, but you still behave as if you're a permanent income guy and consume the annuity every period by paying a higher price. When your debt is excessively high, you don't have incentives to repay back your debt. You stay high. So that has implications for a business cycle. So there's a characterization of transitions. This was in partial equilibrium, but there's a characterization of transitions that rides of the log utility of the saver and this behavior of the buyer. And the first result is that if you start from low debt levels, now that interest rates are adjusting, there's a domain of attraction for toward a good steady state where if you start with high debt levels and you track the Euler equation over time, you can characterize almost analytically where debt is going to go. So that leads to the first result. I call an undisrupted steady state, one where there's no chain payments. So if debt starts below a certain threshold, you are at an undisrupted steady state. And for B sufficiently small, there's monotonic convergence towards good steady state. So there's a domain of attraction for good steady states. Now, because of the property that if your debt is really high, you stay with high debt, there's also hysteresis, hysteresis when there's high debt or debt overhang. And so there's a possibility of disrupted steady states where in steady state, there are chain payments. And the result is that if debt is sufficiently high, then any de debt level above that threshold is a disrupted steady state. So graphically, what that means is that for any level of debt such that the value function is stepping over the value function where you're constrained forever, that's a region where the saver is you know, at steady state with rate interest rates one over beta, and the worker is at steady state with interest rate one over beta, but paying a high cost for its chain goods, but it has no incentives to reduce its debt level, even though that would allow him to buy cheaper. And that's because the benefits come too far into the future. So this is a feature that differs from, differs from macro finance models where you, agents always have incentives to to um, save away from their constraints. Here you have hysteresis. So now let me talk about um, efficiency. So regarding efficiency, a, a starting point to think about efficiency because you have two agencies to think efficiency from the perspective of a steady state. So I set up Pareto weights so that you equalize the Pareto weights to some debt level that would be efficient at steady state. So this is to guarantee that the planner wants to go to some, to the same steady state uh, that you would have in a competitive equilibrium transition to think about inefficiencies along the transition path. So the starting point are these Pareto weights. And then I think of a planner that respects the transactions technology. Uh, it respects prices but it can set taxes on expenditures. It cannot distinguish the type of expenditure, but it can set up a consumption tax. It can set up a capital tax and a labor income tax. And this is just to think about efficiency. So the first result is that a planner with this taxes can implement the allocation of a static planner that essentially chooses debt, once you choose debt, you know ex exactly what each agent is, is spending. And the planner takes into consideration the 
borrowing limit and how depending on the level of debt that he chooses statically, that maps into TFP or a price and that maps into different uh, consumption amounts. So the planner has enough tools to, it's equivalent to choosing debt statically every period. And the first result is that because the planner has enough instruments to choose debt, it'll choose debt to target the almost something that is like the first order condition unconditionally of steady state, but it's a distorted Euler equation for the planner or a distorted uh, consumption insurance equation for the planner. Now, the model has another interesting feature for my taste, which is that depending on the level of credit constraints, the planner faces different trade-offs between insurance that is allocating consumption between borrower and, 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 and saver and distorting production insurance. So the best way to explain things is through this picture. So if if the borrowing limit beta tilde is sufficiently high, the planner sets the debt level with maps into expenditures and maps into consumption to the steady state level that is efficient. So by setting, by choosing debt, it chooses expenditures and it chooses the allocation because of log utility. If you tighten the debt limit a little bit as you move to the left, the borrowing limit a little bit to the left, the planner moves along this line, which means that there's no distortion in production. He's just distorting insurance. He's saying, now that the worker is constrained, let me lower his debt level. That's not good because it's hurting the saver and it's allocating resources away from the optimal, from the social insurance perspective, but by doing that, it does not distort production. So production remains efficiently. After a certain point, you start, the planner starts distorting a little bit of production, but always giving enough um, expenditures to the, to the worker until it reaches a point where it says, in order to guarantee economic efficiency, I'm distorting production a little bit, but I'm distorting social insurance a lot. I'm giving too much wealth by reducing debt to the, to the borrower at the detriment of the saver. At some point it switches because there, there's a region where the complementarity and substitutability between insurance and production efficiency change. And he switches automatically to the other extreme where he says, now let me give all the, you know, or more wealth to the saver, to the rich guy, so that he can make more spot payments that he would in steady state. So I'm hurting the guy that is already hurt by the borrowing constraint, but by making him spend more, he's um, reactivating the economy. So that is an interesting feature because if you look okay. at the- Sorry, sorry yeah. for that. Maybe, maybe they're getting yes. like wrapping up in like the next couple of minutes. Yes, I'm going to wrap up in in, in just one, uh, two, give me two minutes. Perfect, perfect. So first feature is that if you look at competitive transition, the solid black line and a competitive and the planner's transition, the planner switches from distorting the interest rate to give wealth, to creating super high interest rates to give wealth to the saver. But there reaches a point where as the borrowing limits are not as tight, it lowers the interest rate a lot, giving wealth back to the, to the worker. So um, it's a completely different behavior than, than we're usually thinking, used to think about. And the second thing we do, or I do, is think of government multipliers when the government can make chained expenditures and spot expenditures just like agents. And here the government multipliers for chain goods are always negative. But for spot goods, they're zero if there are no constraints, if constraints are not active. But if constraints are active and you're in a crisis, 
spot expenditures can lead to positive multipliers and even positive welfare, but only if the government spends in crisis, A, and B, if it spends spot. If the government comes in and says, I'm gonna make chain expenditures, then it actually has a negative effect on welfare and on multipliers. So to conclude, the paper is an attempt to formalize this idea of payment chain crisis and delays in payments. It focuses on payment externalities. There are some novel implications from the positive angles of hysteresis and inefficient transitions. And the policy recommendations depend on the severity of the crisis and how governments can spend. So that's the end of the paper. Beautiful. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, before uh, getting on the conversation, uh, Nobu has prepared a few slides to uh, support oh. his comment. Uh, Thank you, Nobu. Yeah, it was amazing. I it was, we, we started a bit late, but it's still great. Nobu, is it okay yeah. if I make you a co-host and you can share your screen? Okay. How do you do? Uh, let me to disable. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was, I was just being... They, you know, there is a payment, there is a delay on the steps on, <laughs> I the, on the presentation. Just a second. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oops. Not yet. You should be able to do it now. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I thought that I have to <laughs> discuss something. <laughs> so I prepared some slide, actually. So I think it's a good paper. And it's important questions. Uh, so payment delay leads to production delay and TFP loss. And the quest, this is titled the theory of payment chain crisis. And uh, my first question was where the crisis come from? And the uh, answer seems to be like uh, initial debt is too big, but where, why initial debt is so big? And perhaps uh, there are some sort of sudden stop going on uh, in your model. And the uh, second question, which is the typically like uh, all the production is uh, about 40% of production and uh, produce to stock is another 40 and the produce on spot is 20. That's the kind of old ancient books by Avroma bits paper. And that means the majority of the produce to order goods is not the consumption goods, actually the uh, intermediate goods. So therefore payment chain becomes production chain. So it's a bit like a Isla's stuff. And uh, so what happened, interesting aspects of this payment chain chain interact with production chain is the, if the farm I produce for uh, farm I plus one and pays to the farm I minus one as a customer, then liquidity shock, which is the Saki uh, look at it, is uh, traveling to the upstream farms. So you don't pay or you delay the payment and then there their supplier have to delay the payment to uh, their supplier. So it's going upstairs, upstream. While the typical productivity shock, if you fail to produce, it goes to downstream. So the user is going to get hit, like a supply chain shocks. So, so it might be uh, up, at some point, you can think about that sort of things. And uh, more related to Saki's production uh, chain, credit chain model, is the Saki actually chop up the period in some kind of one period. Within the one period, you can do a lot of things, but across the period, you cannot do anything. And uh, But the typical production chain and payment chain is on real time. So if you can use the uh, staggered uh, payment. So like uh, you as a producer receive the order and then start the production. And then once you receive the order, you can use that money to make the order. And then your supplier starts producing and uh, you make a payment. And then at some point uh, you finish the production 
but the uh, you receive the order and then middle point after delta one minus delta or something you receive the payment and you can use this money to make a payment so so you can zigzag together by using the staggered contract staggered production and payment and uh, so if you can do that uh, but Saki's environment you cannot do it uh, the, this, this will resolve the inefficiency in steady state. But the problem of this kind of zigzag together things is the payment chains uh, become more vulnerable to the shock to the liquidity as well as productivity. That's the uh, problem of this uh, sort of zigzag together style model. So, so my two substantive comment is the production chain and payment chain is often related because of it's about the intermediate goods. And also often people can ab avoid these things <laughs> by uh, staggered uh, production and the payment expenditure. But that makes... Oh, even, that's true even if you have discounting within periods? Yeah, yeah. You do this, yeah. So, so this is the data in terms of, uh, yeah, you can do... I think the staggered payment is the, uh, if you can do it across a period, not? Yeah. Yes, I see. Okay, so that's my comment. I will stop here. Perfect, thank you. Uh, also, if you, if it's the tell you, if you want to stop sharing. Uh, yeah, so how do you do the stop? Uh, if you go to the green, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, I see. Stop okay. share. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, perfect. So, folks, floor is open uh, for other comments. And maybe if you, Saki, you want to start by responding to Nobu, that would be great as well. Uh, and folks that are attendees, if you have uh, anything you want to say, raise your hand and I'll promote you into a panelist. Yeah, I have to. No, this, thank you, Nobu. That's very nice. Um, so this is Moses Abramovich, I guess. That, but I, I knew of the name, yeah. but not of his work. Uh, so I'll have to dig, dig into that. Um, I'm just um, on the on the timing of, you know, if you had like staggered contracting, mm -hmm. I, I my inclination would have think would have been to think if there's still if there's discounting across periods, there will still be uh, will be some problems because yes, uh, the good you know you can tomorrow raise funds but but the good tomorrow will be worth uh a beta if you you have to deliver mm -hmm. it later yeah but so there's still a loss still the loss but it's much smaller than yours oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so it could, it could because be, of the no, no, no. worker cannot don't have to be idle so <laughs> right 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 but uh but the good is worth uh one over beta as opposed to one um also within the period here, you're, you know, some production is going to infinity at the exponential rate. So it's also very extreme, the drop in TFP in my model. Uh, since no one has like, I'll come back to, to the thing that I, just because the was the way that I was thinking is like how this interacts with, uh, other search frictions right like my, my understanding and you correct if i if i miss something is that we all are kind of know our production at this point in time so we all know our demands so if there was no delay in payment or if everyone has the resource and pay spot you always you always have instantaneous payment in production right mm -hmm. so if there was kind of a delay on the on the payment chain right like so if you you, I already have to wait. So I have to wait for the payment chain, but I already have to wait to find the expenditure opportunity anyways. So that would not matter. Uh, so like I, I have to wait for to get my, my payment at the end of the month, but I know I only spent two months from now, so I don't care. So it's kind of like feels that if if you slow, like you, you took the limit where consumption is very fast and payments is low, but like, it seems to me that what it, what matters kind of almost the relative of the two, so you could slow down consumption and and then you the payment the the time for the ch payment chain doesn't matter. That 
I, I think you want to highlight yeah, yeah, I, I, sounds I, great that you took the limit, but like it's it, kind it, of like it's, the, it's related the to the following. It's one way to think about that comment is suppose you you rule out chain payments. It's not because you say, okay, if you don't if you have to wait, you cannot make an order because you just don't have you rule them out. That's going to improve uh, production because the guy, in some sense, is cr the guy making chain payments is crowding out guys that could have made spot payments. So if you say chain payments cannot appear until people have the money, that's what I think I interpret your delay. Uh -huh. Then there's going to be there's still always one unit of, of production. So prices, the interest rate would adjust so that the guys that can make spot actually make spot payments and there will be no TFP losses. So if you force that, you have to you know, only make payments when you already have the funds, then you increase production. That's true. But you're also hurting insurance because the guy that's making chained orders hates to make chained orders. It, the price is really high, but he really has no other way to consume. And so, but he's happy, he's happy to pay a high price uh -huh. uh, because he has no other way to consume. But then yeah. in doing so, he's imposing an externality on society. Thanks. Thanks. So in, in some sense, it relates to the, yeah. the planner problem that I that I described yeah, here, no, because the planner is altering the fraction of chain payments considering insurance and considering the inefficiency yeah. of production i was thinking that as if that was a part of a feature of the environment like uh, like in many search models you're you're posing that actually gdp would go up if it was not even a, uh, if it was a policy you're thinking as a policy mechanism which yeah. it's fine i was thinking more like if that was a right the environment you have to search for counterparties to trade anyway so it takes time let, let the thanks but i yeah thanks all right saki <clears throat> so Hi, uh very nice one interesting aspect of this is the fact that the debt level matters a lot for the implications and at the yeah. same time you don't have this incentive to uh bring down debt so in a sense the model is like closer to angeletos than to Agari. So can you give us again, like, or the intuition of why is that? So why exactly you don't have an incentive to repay that debt, uh, even though the debt limit matters so much? Yeah. So, so you have incentives to repay debt when debt is low. So you can be constrained. If you're not constrained too much, you, you have incentives to repay. And the idea is if you, if you save a little bit, eventually you're going to enjoy better prices. But when you're super constrained, you in order to save, you have to cut back your consumption from bad steady state consumption. It has a cost in marginal utility. You can save, you can take, you know, that extra amount that you sacrifice will lead into low, like higher wealth in the future. But, and that's going to allow you to enjoy better prices in the future but you're discounting the future as well. So that in the, at some point you do a marginal decision where you say, you know, I'm consuming so little because I have so much debt. I'm paying a high price. It really doesn't, it's, it's inconvenient for me to save because the benefit come too far into the future. It's like a poverty trap where you say, you know, if you have very, very poor people, if, if they were to save, they could also think, You'll spend more time on choosing better prices or negotiate or have better savings technology. Uh, it's that kind of logic. And, and, and here they don't. The novelty is the externality, I guess. Chucky, I have a clarifying question. So yes. can you say a little bit more about um, the government? Um, so how would the, like the government doing chain uh, transactions that would be a tra chain spending that would be the government is telling the the seller um, I can pay you uh, only after I get paid uh, but the government yes. 
Okay, uh, so it's a little perfect, bit like an agency so, or something. So, so the government, no, no, it it works identically to to the to the household, except that the government, the income source for the government is a tax collector. So he's mm-hmm. gonna collect taxes, and so he says, um, "This is not a model of government uh, debt. It's a government of a model of within the period how the government pays." So the government is always budget balanced between periods. Mm. But the government could say, I'm going to collect taxes, labor taxes at the end of the period. After people pay me at the end of the period. So the spot government is as as if the government could borrow intra-period just like households and spend. The chain government expenditure says, I have a source of income, which is labor tax. It's as if I was buying some labor inputs and I, I pay only when I'm, my taxes are, are, are paid. Okay. So kind of like pay as you go. Saki. Yeah. First, just to, for me to clarify, and maybe probably I understand very well. Uh, this, delay, this delay payments kind of thing is I meet you and I, something I tell you, look, I cannot pay now. Uh, and then we agree that at some point you will give me goods and I will pay you the future. It's kind of, uh, is that? That's, the, the, that's the way to think about it is I, I don't have goods. I don't have money. Yeah. But somebody else come, has come to me and says, I'm going to buy from you. And so I, I, tell, I tell you, Nico, if you're producing for me, I'm going to, Show you the funds when he has paid me. I don't know when he's coming. No, no, I got that. But but uh, but then the production side uh, it happens when you sh- when you give me the funds, right? I I you start producing when I show you the funds. But but I, can... but no, but you get the fun, but you get the goods when you when you give me the funds. I start producing, but you get the goods. You, I get the good at the end of the period when you finish production. I, so I get my question. I wanted to confirm. It's not that. May I, mean, I don't understand very well, but it's not a theory of delay payments. It's a it's a it's a theory it's a theory of delay transaction. To me, delay payments has an implication that I give you goods, uh, and you pay me later, something like that. I mean, like, but this is not that, right? I mean, like, I know you see, well, like, but I'm some not... agents are are releasing the funds late. Nobody's releasing the funds. No, but the goods are not being released before that, no? Or am I? Am the goods I... are not produced until you show me the funds. No, show me or give me the funds. And that's what I'm, I'm show doing. me the funds. Show me the funds. I release the funds to you when I inspected the good. So there's a little, there's a, and the reason why that happens is because suppose you had only one guy in the economy that is spot and there's no inspection delay. Then one guy would make spot payments and everything would travel around the, the network immediately. I, I, you need I to have a delay I, between between. I payment just kind of really struggle with the kind of with the wording. I mean, like I know, but then for this delayed payments, you get money before you. I get money before actually give you the goods to you. Yes. So why is that delayed payment? What 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 is that delayed payment? Uh, it's just kind of well because I, with the you, know, you you could have paid me at time zero and you paid me at time one half. Ideally, everything should be paid at time zero. Can I, can I just uh, see if I, like, it, it, just to try to think about it. It's, is it like uh, I get in a restaurant and I get a table, but you're not going to produce my, my food until I show you I have the funds, but you, I'm kind of taking the table already, right? Like I read, put the order on. Yes. Is that correct? So you're yes. not serving. So it's so in some sense, it is the delayed payment because I'm blocking other people from ordering for you. Yes. Because I read made the order. Yes. Even though you're not producing right now, you're just sitting there waiting to see the, the, the money for, yes. for okay. Yes. The, the analogy that I put is like I'm building a roof in my house. The the constructor comes and he's putting the concrete in my garden. He can't take it anywhere. It now mm-hmm. becomes a, a bilateral relation. And he doesn't want to build the roof until I show him that I have a, a you know money. Because if he once he builds the roof, is the roof of my house, I, he, there's nothing he can do with the good. Um so, but in doing that, I've isolated the constructor. He's already at my garden. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. This and is then as things are delayed, the, the product is worse and worse. It's not the it's not the most thing, the, the most palatable thing or relatable thing, but I think it's a good way to think of a starting place to think about transactions across firms, as, as Nobu was putting. Sagi, I mean, it's super cool, eh? I mean, like, I know. Uh, Thank you. I, I guess when you start talking about uh, delays at the beginning, I, I always think, uh, not delays, so I think about that usually firms give to other firms kind of 30 lines, or they tell you, okay, you, you can order and you pay me in nine months and stuff like that. I mean, if that's, if this, is this your that's analogy? Not, what that's you, the what analogy you? that I want to, to build. Yeah. I mean, ideally, I would like to think more in terms of what Nobu described. More, more in terms of you know firms and transactions, but I thought this was the simplest way to to think about it with like, uh, you know, very simple bilateral relations. But you know, firms put many orders, and and then the the the, the combinatorial issues become. No, no, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to do something that could be a little bit more analytic and and, and learn something from it. But but I, it's not a realistic environment, and it's. It's just to, that my hope is just to get some lessons out of it and, and make me think perhaps on how to make it more realistic. But, uh, so, one, one more.